Last week we began looking at a letter that Paul wrote to his young mentee, Timothy. Um, Second Timothy actually became the last letter that Paul wrote. In the first few lines of the letter, Paul affirms Timothy for his sincere faith and his refusal to wear the masks that culture tends to lead us toward putting on around other people. He challenged him. For the rest of the letter, Paul puts on his coaching hat now. And he begins to challenge Timothy and encourage him to add some discipline to his life. To add some discipline. Paul sees that Timothy was made for more. He sees something in Timothy that really Timothy doesn't even see in himself. He begins with the instruction, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. In the Middle East during Paul's life, people had to build fires for every meal. And so instead of having to start a fire every time they came to fix a meal or to boil water, they would keep the embers going. And it, usually it was a child's job to, to go out and to fan the flames and to stoke the fire and get the flames going a little more around mealtime so that they could fix the meal for the family. So Paul used this common imagery that Timothy would have been aware of because more than likely Timothy was probably that kid because he grew up in a home where it was just him and his mom. Dad left him pretty early in life. Paul uses that imagery to, to bring something to his attention. You see, Timothy had gifts that Paul specifically saw in Timothy. And he wanted him to practice those gifts. What he was telling Timothy was, you have those gifts, but it's your responsibility to use them. It's your responsibility to fan those flames that Christ put in you. And what would he do with them? Would he allow them to go out? Or would he fan them? What Paul was saying was smoldering embers don't accomplish much. You need a roaring bonfire to step into all that God has created for you to do. If Paul were in our church today, I think he would commend us for a few things. I think he would commend us for serving the community, for not just simply being about the people inside the church, but for caring for the people outside of the church. But I think Paul would also challenge us. He would also challenge us to use our spiritual gifts. He would probably say to us, what good are the gifts if you are not using them to forward God's purpose in your life and in the community. So what are spiritual gifts? What are these spiritual gifts that Paul is talking to Timothy about? Quick little tutorial for you on spiritual gifts. So what is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is a divine enablement, an endowment, or a capability that God places in you so that you are good at something by God's power. And for his purposes, for his glory. So these are specific things that God has put inside of you for his glory and for his purposes. Who receives spiritual gifts? According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, he says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 
important part in there, each one. If you are sitting in here today, you're included in that each one. Okay, uh, each one. Do I have to repeat that a few more times so you get it? Each person here has these abilities. So who assigns the gifts? Again, Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he says, All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distinguishes them to each, each one just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit determines what gifts you have. So I may have gifts that you may not have, and you may have gifts that... I don't have. Hence how the body of Christ works better together than apart because God has literally created us to work differently, to think differently, and to assist each other in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit decides who gets what gift. So if you don't like your gift, take it up with Him. That's all I'm saying. How many spiritual gifts are there? In the New Testament, there are 20 spiritual gifts that are defined or laid out for us. But scholars do, don't believe that these were meant to be a complete list. That it was 20 and there's no others. But there are specifically 20 that we can find specifically in the body of Christ. So how do you determine what spiritual gifts you had? I'm glad you asked. Read everything you can on spiritual gifts. Read your Bible. It's a good place to start. Go to classes that are taught. It just so happens in January... I'm going to lead a class, and we're going to look specifically at spiritual gifts. I hope you're all there so that you can find out how how can I serve better in the kingdom of God and in this community. Discuss spiritual gifts with your friends and your family because a lot of times these gifts that we have, they're confirmed in us by the people around us. We may think we're gifted with certain things and more than likely your friends might say, uh, no, you're not. You, you don't need to be working in the nursery. That is not a good place for you. That's me. Not a good place for me. Jump into areas and, and serve. You'll quickly find out whether or not you're meant to be there. When I felt called to ministry and, and I began um, uh, being under leaders, uh, my brother-in-law, Jeff Luke, he was the youth pastor at the church that I was at. And so in talking with him, he said, here's the best place to start. Come help with the youth group. Who? The youth group. Okay. So I started helping out with teenagers. My first first thing I did as a youth sponsor, no joke, was one of the dumbest things I ever did, was I went on a middle school ski trip. And it just so happens that John was on that trip. John and I didn't get along very well. But I had to jump in. What Jeff was telling me was get involved. If youth ministry is not where you're called to, you'll find out. You'll know. I don't believe youth ministry is where I was called to ministry. But I learned a lot of important things about ministry in that setting. So get involved. But here's the thing. Jesus calls all of us to be brave. Some of you, when you think about yourself, you may not... Consider yourself all that brave. But Jesus literally calls us as followers of Christ to be brave. And Paul, who's writing this letter to Timothy, 
And he's encouraging and challenging Timothy to be brave. But you see, Timothy would have known what Paul had been through. You see, when Timothy's listening to Paul as, as he's reading the words of his mentor, he's recalling the things that Paul would have done. And so just to give you a brief idea of what kind of brave Paul's talking about, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. He went through quite a bit. He went through a lot. Many of us will never go through things that Paul went through. But why was, so, why was Paul so willing to go through these sufferings? Why was he willing to do that? To help you understand that, I'm going to bring your attention to the season of the times. The season of the times is football season. That's what the season is. It's football season. And I love to watch the rookie quarterbacks. Because you can always tell which ones are going to have a career and which ones probably won't be around next year. Because you, there's this thing that the defense does that quarterbacks tend to not like. It's called a blitz. And what the blitz is, is they're going to go a little faster. Their defense is set up specifically to attack the quarterback quicker than a normal play. And when this blitz happens, you'll see the quarterback do one of two things. Either they panic and they begin to run around all over the place trying to find an open person and most of the time they don't and they either get hit or throw the ball somewhere off in space and who knows where they're trying to throw it to. But good quarterbacks will sit back. It's called sitting in the pocket because they're sitting in this pocket that's created by their offensive line. And they're sitting there, and good quarterbacks remember their play. They rely on the people in front of them, and they sit in this pocket, and they find their open receivers. You see, all of us are just like the quarterback. We all face that blitz. We all face that pressure that comes on us. You know, you fill in the blank of what that circumstance is. I know you're all familiar with what I'm talking about. If you've lived any life beyond 10 years of age, you've been blitzed at some point in your life. You've had something that has come about in your life that has totally just thrown you off of what you've expected in those moments. And as Paul was in prison for the last time, a messenger came to him. And he brought this report about the church in Ephesus. Because this report said that there were cynics and there were critics and heretics that were threatening to destroy the church in Ephesus. This church that Paul had created, Paul had started when his, he journeyed first to Ephesus. Paul received word that Timothy had become timid in using his gifts. 
and he had begun running from what God had called him to do. But you see, Paul, Paul is like Peyton Manning. Paul can see the blitz before anyone else can. Paul sees what's happening. Paul sees what Timothy is under. He sees what he's going to be facing. And so he challenges him to stand firm. To remember what you've been called to. And so he says in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. It says that you had your hands laid on you. What would have happened is when a person was being commissioned or was being sent out to do God's work, the elders of the church would have come around Timothy and they would have laid their hands on him. And they would have began praying to God that God would use him but they would also begin to shout out gifts that they would see in young Timothy in ways that God would use him for the kingdom. And so they would begin to just shout out the gifts that he had. That he was a teacher. That when he teaches, people respond. People hear the word of God and unlike any other time when other people speak, there's just something about when Timothy speaks, people hear it differently. That God speaks through him. He would have called out gifts. You see, when they laid hands on them, what they were doing was they were literally calling out the Imago Dei in Timothy. The Imago Dei is the image of God that appears in us. You see, we were all created in the image of God. Within each of us is that Imago Dei. That part of us that was created to represent Christ to the people around us. To be used for the people around us. And he tells young Timothy... That this spirit that put these gifts in you was not timid. But that spirit was strong. That spirit was of power and of love. Self-discipline. That same power that is in each of us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you believe that? Do you honestly believe that? That that same physical power that raised Jesus from the dead is in each side of each one of us. That love that casts out fear is inside each of us. God has given us the ability to come around people and to support them when people are fearful about the things that are happening to them or what might happen to them, he's given us the ability, the power to love them in such a way that it removes that fear. You know, when a storm comes, my kids end up in my room. When it's storming, I know where they're, they're coming. I hear thunder, they're going to be coming. Why? Why do they come into my room? Because they're safe there. Because that fear is gone because of who they're in the presence of. They know that if they're with mommy and daddy, they'll be okay. We all have that power. 
to comfort people and to love them and to take away a fear. But he also gives us this spirit of self-discipline. This one we tend to not like all that much because we don't like the word discipline. And then when you add in the fact that we have to do it to ourselves, it's a whole new ball game. This ability to see what God has given us to do and then choosing to actually do it. To discipline our lives, to be able to use it in the kingdom of God for his glory. So real quickly, I want to look through the rest of this section with you. Verse 8. Paul goes on, he says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel, the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Why is Paul so willing to suffer? Why is Paul so willing to suffer for the gospel? You see, Paul was able to be at peace with his suffering because he knew that his suffering was due to the fact that he was doing what God had called him to do. He knew that no matter what humanity threw at him, as long as he was doing what God had called him to, then it didn't matter what happened to him. Because here's the thing. God created you. He knows exactly what he has planned for you. And here's the great thing about God creating us and knowing exactly what he's created for us to do. You do not die until he's done with you. So until you're dead, you're not done. So if you're breathing in this room and you have spiritual gifts, there is no retirement. God is still using you, still wants to use you. And Paul knows that as long as I'm alive, I have a goal, I have a mission, I have what God has called me to do, and I'm going to do that whatever means possible. You want to put me in prison? Go ahead. You see what happens with letters from prison? How many billions of people have been inspired, have been instructed and guided in their walk with Christ because of Paul's letters? What if Paul would have said, oh, I'm in prison. I can't do anything. They've shut me down. I'll just give up. I mean, come on. He could have easily blamed the prison guards. He could have blamed the people who put him in prison. He could have just said, God, it was beyond my power. Sorry, I wanted to help you, but come on, send some more angels to get me out of prison or something. He did that a few times. Read the book of Acts. It's in there. But he knew that no matter what I am, no matter what my situation is, these are the things I'm called to do. These are the things that God has put in my life specifically to use me. And just in case you're wondering what they are, he goes on to tell you. He says, this grace has been given to us. Sorry, back up, verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, but not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Oh, hold on a second. 
You mean I'm not supposed to use these for me? You mean it's not, I don't have these gifts because of, of what I get to do. I don't get to use them however I want. Now see, the gifts that you have were meant for one thing. God's purpose. You see, we can take the things that God has given us for his purpose and we can easily twist them and use them for something else. But it's not what he's called us to. This grace has given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. For it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I am appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Because God had called him to be a herald, to be a teacher, to be an apostle for the body of Christ. And Paul lived his life around those three things. And that is why he suffered. And so he was willing to suffer. Yet this is no cause for shame. Because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul is saying that he can guard something. Paul says that there's a deposit that has been made. You see, we each have made a deposit with God. And we have to make ourselves, we have to ask ourselves the question, will we trust him to guard it? You see, each of us, we make a deposit into our relationship with God. We make a deposit of faith. We make a deposit of hope and of eternal destiny. Do we trust him with that? Have we made that deposit with him? Have we trusted him to guard it? In verse 13, when you heard from me, what you hear from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Wait, there's another deposit that has been made. You see, that deposit was the gospel. That inside each of us, God has deposited the gospel. That with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we have a responsibility. What will we do with it? You see, Paul says that we're to guard that deposit. And if you're to guard something, that means you've been entrusted with something. And that means you have a responsibility to that deposit that has been made in your life. If the Holy Spirit has graced every Christ follower with these supernatural abilities... And this divine endowment that he's put inside of us that could fulfill them and forward the kingdom of God. Why is it less than 25% of people actually identify and use their spiritual gifts? Let me help you out, just in case you didn't realize why you probably might do it. People say, you just haven't taken the time to discover them. I don't have time. It's something else. Something else to add to my plate of things that I have to do. People say they're too busy. I don't have time to do that. That requires me to sit down and think about myself, and I can't do that right now. People say they don't think they've received any spiritual gifts or 
they probably wouldn't use them even if they had them. But let me recall you or draw your attention to a parable in Matthew chapter 25. You see, Jesus tells this parable about this man who gave his servants some resources. Two of them brought back more resources than they had been given. But one of them, one of them, he was, he was scared. He was scared. He didn't want anything to happen to this money that he had been trusted with. So he did the only smart thing he could think of, and he went and buried it. So that when his servant came, or when his master came back, he could return the money to him. But it was that servant who was called foolish because he did nothing with the gift that had been given to him. I think I've told you before about a, a, one of my favorite runners, Steve Prefontaine. He has this quote that he's you know, quoted as saying, he says, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. to not discover what they are, to not care what they are, to know what they are and not use them, is to sacrifice the gift. And here's the thing, we'll never be the person God created us to be if we don't use the gifts he's given us. God has called each of us to be brave. He's called us to be brave and to use the gifts that he's empowered us with. The people who are the bravest are those who trust their gifts. And they do so by deciding to lean into their gifts, defining how they will use those gifts and declaring that when the pressure rises, they will stand and they won't run. They'll stay firm in those gifts. They'll trust those gifts. That if this is what God has given me to do, then I need to use those gifts and I need to trust Him. One of my gifts. Is kind of similar to Paul's. Uh, I am not an apostle. I'm not going to add apostle to the front of my name. Um, but one of the gifts is called apostleship. It's, I have this thing within me that loves to start new things. This entrepreneurial spirit within me that starts new things. And one of the things is you start new things, but you don't like remain the leader of it forever. You, you hand off the leadership to someone to, to carry on what, you, what you've done. And I've got tons of things always going through my mind of what can, what can I start? What can, I'm always looking to start something. Jennifer hates it. I'm always looking to start something. One of my, another one of my gifts that I don't like it, it's administration. I don't like it. Someone asked me, he said, you know, said you're really good at, at getting things like organized and doing it. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, I do it because I have to. But then it was like, I come across all these people that are in the same situation I am, that they're the only pastor in their church, and it's like, you're not all that good at administration. That's not their gift. They got to do the things that they're gifted at. And you see, there are things that, that I can do in this church, but it's not my gifting. And let me ask you a question. What would you require of me as your pastor? To do the things that all of you want me to do, or to do the things that God has called me to do? Which one do you think I will be most productive at? 
second one. And here's the thing for you. What would be more productive? To put you in a place or a situation doing something that you can do but aren't gifted at or putting you in a ministry doing what you're gifted at putting you in a place where you're gifted at right let's just be honest with you some of you should not be greeters just saying some of you aren't all that happy in the morning it's just a matter of fact let's not be like throwing stuff at each other let's just say let's be honest that's not the place for you some of you shouldn't be in the nursery I should not be in the nursery you know I we would call in the police not like someone to help me I mean it, it wouldn't be good just ask my niece back there she doesn't like me but here's the thing why do I want to do this you see I believe God has big things for this church and I believe we're limiting what God wants to do through us in this community because we're not putting people where they need to be we're just trying to fill vacancies in we're trying to put people into spots to have it covered instead of putting people where God has gifted them and so in January whether you come to my class or not I want everyone to take a spiritual gifts test. Yes, there's like 130 some questions. Please sacrifice five minutes of your time to answer some questions. And then it ends up giving you your top three gifts. And here's the thing. Human people wrote the test. It's very possible that you won't agree with the results. But here's the thing. Try it. And if it's not you, we find out. But we don't know if we don't try. And so we're going to start plugging people in where they're gifted at. There are some of you out there that have the gift of hospitality. You should be greeters because that's your gift. Some of you are, are great leaders your leaders in your jobs and, and you should be in leadership some of you know administration better than I do matter of fact some of you have taught me about administration <laughs> some of you are really good at helping other people so we need to plug you in with people that need help some of you are awesome like I, most of you probably know Bernie Garrett if I've got a prayer concern like a big prayer thing you better be sure I've contacted her and she's got it I mean she's awesome at praying she can sit for hours and pray I'm like five minutes and I'm gone nuts but she has that gift of praying some of you have that gift let's use our gifts for the kingdom of God because that's when we'll be at our best and we won't be sacrificing your gifts because I guarantee you you do not want me to be the pastor and sacrifice the gifts that God has given me but I don't want you to sacrifice the gifts God has given you because when we do that all we do is hurt the kingdom of God and we also hurt ourselves because we're not truly who God created us to be if we're not living within what he's put in us. And to do that, we have to be brave. We have to be brave. We have to be willing to stand firm in what God has called us to do. God has called us and he's made us for more. How will you use what he's put inside of you?